Good evening, I'm Nima Rajan and this is Forum Daily for Thursday, October 13th. We begin tonight in Ottawa, where a highly anticipated public inquiry into the government's use of the Emergencies Act in February began today. In his opening remarks, Commissioner Paul Rouleau warned of tight timelines. This came as he urged everyone involved to work together to enlighten Canadians. Several parties to the inquiry are expected to appear throughout the week's long process. This includes the Prime Minister, convoy leaders, police forces and more. The 1988 Act requires that a public inquiry be held and a report from the Commission is mandated for release by early next year. All right, well, meanwhile, the parliamentary budget officer is projecting the economy will slow considerably in the second half of 2022. Budget watchdog Yves Giroux says the economy will likely remain weak next year as the Bank of Canada continues to raise interest rates. In his latest economic and fiscal outlook, Mr. Giroux says he expects the central bank to raise its key interest rate to 4% by the end of the year. Now, this is before slashing it in late 2023 as inflation slows. Canada's foreign affairs minister is announcing new sanctions against Iranian officials and entities tied to human rights violations and disinformation. Melanie Jolie says the measures will mean that 17 more individuals and three entities are barred from entering Canada or doing business with most Canadian firms. All right, switching gears to a recent warning from Canada's envoy to the United States regarding the cross-border Nexus Trusted Traveler Program. She says the Nexus program is being held hostage by a U.S. effort to renegotiate the 20-year-old agreement unilaterally. The 13 enrollment centers in Canada remain closed. This comes amid a dispute over legal protections for the U.S. pre-clearance officers who work there. Kristen Hillman says that as the dispute drags on, the backlog of applications, which is over 350,000, continues to grow, while pressure to fix it continues to mount. Manitoba's premier says her government is not planning legislation to push back against Ottawa over areas of jurisdiction. This comes despite what Alberta and Saskatchewan are planning. But Heather Stephenson says she is worried about Ottawa reaching into provincial areas. Ms. Stephenson says she would like to see the federal government change its position or show some flexibility on carbon pricing. Turning to the ongoing investigation of a fatal conflict that left one man and two Ontario police officers dead. The two officers died responding to a call at a home in the town of Innisville. Ontario's police watchdog says they did not draw their firearms before they were shot fatally. A spokeswoman for the Special Investigations Unit says a third officer who was at the home also exchanged gunfire with the 23-year-old suspect. The man, identified as Chris Doncaster, was a private in the armed forces, but he was never deployed and did not complete basic training. All right, well, on the West Coast, the B.C. Coroner Service says the province's toxic drug crisis was a key factor in the rising number of deaths among the homeless. A preliminary report shows there were 247 deaths, which is 75 percent higher than last year. Now, this is something that Chief Coroner Lisa LaPointe says reflects the risks and realities that homeless people face daily. She says many face significant health concerns, including physical disabilities, mental health challenges and substance use issues. The report says 85 percent of deaths were accidental and 93 percent of those accidental deaths were caused by the illicit drug supply. On the other side of the country, the Newfoundland and Labrador government is increasing income support rates by 5% as of November 1st. Officials say the increase is intended to help people offset the soaring cost of living. As of July, more than 28,000 people were relying on the program. This includes more than 6,700 children. All right, taking a look at housing prices now, which the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation is predicting will continue to drop. The group says housing prices will continue to drop in 2023, but is warning that the fall will do little for affordability. Patrick Perrier, the housing agency's deputy chief economist, expects the national average home price to fall 15 percent from the peak seen in the first quarter of this year by the end of the second quarter of 2023. 
Mr. Perrier attributes the drop to housing demand slowing as interest rates rise. Now, despite the price decline, Mr. Perrier believes housing affordability will not improve. This is because any benefits that can be reaped from the lower prices will be offset by higher interest rates. All right, stay with us. Forum Daily will be right back. And when we return, we're going to be taking a look at investing amid a low Canadian dollar with Brendan Caldwell of Caldwell Securities Limited. Stay with us. Although inflation and interest rate hikes continue to dog people in the United States and Canada, the U.S. dollar remains strong. But it's a different story for its Canadian counterpart. The Canadian dollar has weakened to its lowest level in over two years against the U.S. dollar. Today's consumer price report in the U.S. indicates that the country's central bank will keep raising interest rates aggressively. And this is worrying investors that the aggressive tightening could lead to a recession and add even more pressure on the loonie. Meanwhile, these rate hikes by the Federal Reserve will likely only bolster the U.S. dollar. Well, joining us now to help us make sense of it all is Brendan Caldwell, director of Caldwell Securities Limited. Brendan, welcome back. Thank you, Dima. Now, uh, the U.S. dollar is commonly called the king dollar, Brendan, and it's quite the fitting name these days. So why is the U.S. dollar so strong? Well, I don't know if it's always been king, but uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve has been very uh, aggressive in raising interest rates and uh, more aggressive than Canada, more aggressive than other countries around the world. The idea in classical economic theory is if you raise interest rates as a central bank, by which I mean, in the case of the US, the Fed funds rate or the rate at which the central bank, the government run bank, lends to all the other banks, all the commercial banks, the ones you've heard of like Bank America or Citigroup or these. So as they raise that rate, all the other interest rates, particularly short-term rates, go up in concert. And they're trying to raise rates again, according to classical economic theory, to, to slow down the economy, to make it more difficult for people to access money, borrow for either expenditures or investments that are just trying to slow the economy down. And if you raise your rates as a country faster than the other guy raises his rates, people are going to want to buy your currency because they can get more on their money in a bank account or a treasury bill or other short-term deposit in your country's denomination. So higher rates tends to lead to a much stronger currency and the U.S. being the most aggressive in the world, as well as being the, you say, king dollar. It's, it's, the, it's, the, uh, it's the world reserve currency. So it has that going forward as well. So everybody is around the world is scrambling to buy U.S. dollars at the expense of the loonie and other currencies. Now, at the same time, we know many commodities are priced in U.S. dollars. So how does that affect people or the countries that need to buy these commodities, Brendan? Oh, well, yeah. So other countries kind of get a double whammy. So here in uh, in, in Canada, we're talking 7 8% inflation. The U.S., something similar. Because our dollar has declined, but only a little bit. I mean, a few cents relative to the U.S. dollar. I mean, big in currency terms, but not in global terms. But if you're, say, in Turkey where the official inflation rate is north of 80% and the unofficial rate is probably like 180%. And people don't make more than $10,000 a year on average. When the price of these global commodities like energy uh, go, go up, I mean, in basic stuff to make things like well, copper or anything that's denominated in US dollars, as the price of the US dollar goes up against your currency, the price of everything else that uses energy or food or other raw materials goes up even more. So it, it exacerbates the inflation issue that other countries are experiencing. So it's a, uh, well, maybe a way to slow down the U.S. economy and keep inflation in the U.S. under control. It's actually perhaps making it worse, particularly in developing countries. Now, in terms of uh, developed countries, we know the UK is in a similar situation with the pound fluctuating against the US dollar, and the UK is trying to tackle this issue. So can you tell us a little bit more about their plan? Well, I don't know if they have a plan so much as a series of reactions. You didn't think they'd, they'd, they'd miss their prime minister, Boris Johnson, quite so quickly, um, because by the time he was gone, everybody wanted him to be gone. But the the, the new prime minister there had a plan to subsidize energy costs for the average Britain. Well, that was going to cost 
some vast billions and billions, it sounded like Carl Sagan, billions and billions of pounds. And so the, the um, uh, worldwide uh, investors in bonds and currencies said, oh, the British are going to have to raise billions and billions of, uh, in new financing. So they hit the pound they, uh, very hard. Um, UK, UK interest rates have gone up considerably. It doesn't seem to be a situation where they have so much as a plan as a series of reactions. And the, the British government has re reversed itself at least uh, once or twice uh, just in the past week or so. So not just developing countries, but developed countries like the United Kingdom, uh, they've had a pretty tough month um, with one thing and another. Always lots to keep our eyes out for Brendan Caldwell. Again, thank you so much for joining us today on Forum Daily. Thank you, Nima. Stay with us. We'll be right back. And when we return, we're going to be taking a look at the latest moves in the markets. Forum Daily's weekly market update with Catherine Murray is up next. The host of The Buck Stops here will give us her take on the developments in the financial world. So stay tuned for that. Our weekly market update with Catherine up next. Thanks, Nima. Hello, everyone, and welcome to your weekly market recap. I'm Catherine Murray. Well, markets began the session once again under some significant pressure following a 40-year high in U.S. consumer prices. The headline CPI up 8.2% year over year with significant increases in food as well as shelter, leading the Social Security in the United States to bump up their benefits by 8.2%, trying to keep up with inflation. Medical care costs up 1% month over month, the largest since 1984. Used cars, however, in case you're in the market for one, was actually a bigger drag, down by 1%. The higher print, though, though is now leading investors to price in a 100% chance that, that the U.S. Federal Reserve will raise rates by 75 basis points at their November meeting. Just in case you're keeping your eye on where you think interest rates are going and having to price that into your budget, as we all do. Midday, however, we are seeing the market staging a nice comeback with the Dow up by 300 points, the TSX up by about 1.6%. Uh, no real explanation for the reversal here, but there is speculation that UK Prime Minister Truss's government will treat or tweak their controversial fiscal plan, and that seems to be acting as a, big, a bit of a tailwind for the broader markets. Still, uh, most investors not convinced that the US Federal Reserve uh, will pivot or prevent themselves from tightening uh, further. And that, of course, has been a big drag on all assets. Front and center, of course, will be earnings results. Big kickoff tomorrow with the U.S. Bank, City, J.P. Morgan, as well as Morgan Stanley, all reporting third quarter results tomorrow. Um, there is expectation that net, net interest margin as well as uh, loan growth will be solid, including also asset quality believed to be elevated. Um, investment banking, though, expected to be a little bit on the weaker side. Bottom line, though, investors are fearful that we will see company management's lower guidance, as well as also talk negatively or cautiously about future demand. Having said that, recent negative updates from FedEx, Nike, as well as CarMax may have lowered the bar for this earnings season. Nonetheless, watch for comments on margin pressure, excess inventory, as well as lower demand. Speaking of demand, we do have the IEA cutting their 2023 oil demand growth forecast and warned that the OPEC plus supply cuts announced last week could lead to a global recession. We're also, of course, keeping our, our eyes on what's happening in China with COVID cases rising to the level seen last July, leading to further restrictions, particularly in Shanghai. Recall that China's zero COVID policy has had an adverse effect on global growth. Away from that, we're keeping our eyes on stocks, semi-stocks in particular. TSM uh, did beat and raise their guidance, but also cut CapEx on supply chain constraints and weaker 7 nanometer demand forecasts. Uh, stock, nonetheless, is up by about 8%. AMAT in the semiconductor space as well cut their guidance on China export restrictions. On the consumer read front, which is always interesting to me, uh, Delta guided their earnings more than 40% higher than where the street analysts were anticipating that's on higher consumer spending and also a rebound in corporate spending. That stock dealt up by more than 5%. Walgreens also had some nice earnings results. In terms of looking for stocks that analysts are getting more positive on, uh, an upgrade on Colgate from JP Morgan. Uh, they said that this is one of the few companies that are able to keep their pricing power while cost pressures are starting to alleviate. We also have Comcast upgraded to buy over at City, citing valuation and also an opportunity to improve their asset mix. 
On the Canadian market front, um, more discussion regarding a recession in Canada from the IMF. They have 1.5% growth in 2023. That's down from 3.3% in 2022. RBC now sees a recession happening in Canada sooner than previously forecast, and the unemployment rate hitting 7% in 2023. Um, UBS is actually ranking Toronto as the world's bubbliest housing market. In terms of what to watch for, CPI will be re- released on October the 19th, so next week. And in terms of this week, uh, we have manufacturing and wholesale sales, as well as Korea housing national sales numbers out tomorrow morning. And in terms of stocks to watch, Aritzia, that stock is up by about 5% following a very strong earnings result. VCE has been upgraded uh, by TD to a buy. Uh, that stock up by about 3%, uh, with a share price, uh, uh, target price, I should say, of $66. Obviously, a lot going in the, on in the market right now in terms of concerns regarding inflation, the Fed over tightening, um, the Bank of Canada likely to follow. Perhaps we'll get deeper recessions. Please do watch my interview with David Rosenberg, who is a Wall Street and Bay Street veteran. I pre-taped it today. It will air on Sunday on my show, The Buck Stops Here with Catherine Murray. A lot of detail in terms of his thoughts, in terms of where we go from here. I really encourage you to watch it. A lot of great information from David Rosenberg. I'll leave it there, Nima. Back to you. Stay with us. We'll be right back after a short break. Ukraine's presidential office says Russian forces are using Iranian-made kamikaze drones to attack the Kyiv and Odessa regions. Moscow's continued barrage is seen as retaliation for a truck bomb attack on a bridge to Russia-annexed Crimea. Ukrainian officials say 13 people have been killed and 37 wounded in the past day. This in Russian missile strikes that targeted nine regions of Ukraine. Saudi Arabia says the U.S. has urged the kingdom to postpone a decision by OPEC and its allies, including Russia, to cut oil production. OPEC Plus announced the cuts on October 5th. A delay could have helped to reduce the risk of a spike in gas prices ahead of the U.S. midterm elections next month. A statement today by the Saudi foreign ministry didn't specifically mention the elections, but it said the U.S. suggested the cuts be delayed by a month. All right, well, meanwhile, the managing director of the International Monetary Fund is urging global policymakers to stop inflation from becoming, in her words, a runaway train. Kristalina Georgieva notes that the world economy has been hit by one shock after another. She pointed to the COVID-19 pandemic, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and a resurgence of inflation. But she says reigning in, rising prices should take priority. The Bank of Canada, the U.S. Federal Reserve and other central banks have been raising interest rates to tame inflation. Ms. Georgieva says the higher borrowing costs will pinch economic growth. But she urges policymakers to show restraint in spending money to ease the pain. Tensions in Iran continue to rise, with the president accusing the U.S. of conducting a failed policy of destabilization. Ibrahim Raisi's statement on Thursday came after Iranian cities held protests nationwide, which were sparked by the death of a 22-year-old woman earlier detained by the country's morality police. Mr. Raisi, in repeated comments, has tried to frame the demonstrations following the death of Masa Amini as a Western plot. This even as school-age protesters remove their mandatory headscarves or hijabs. China's internet censors have moved quickly to scrub social media posts. Now, this comes after reports that banners criticizing the communist leadership were hung from a busy intersection in Beijing. Images on Twitter, which are blocked in China, showed smoke spiraling up from a fire on an elevated roadway. And banners calling for an end to the hardline zero-COVID policy and the overthrow of President Xi Jinping. The Associated Press could not verify the authenticity of the images, but the road was scarred in the area where the fire would have been. Political protest is rare in China, and police are on high alert this week. This comes in the run-up to a major Communist Party Congress that opens on Sunday. South of our border, the U.S. House Committee probing last year's January 6th riot on the U.S. Capitol has voted to call Donald Trump to testify. 
The committee voted unanimously to subpoena the former president for personal testimony about the 2021 Capitol attack. It is seen as the boldest move yet by the bipartisan panel, which has interviewed over a thousand people so far. Some tragic news out of Connecticut this morning, where state police say two police officers were fatally shot and a third was wounded. The officers were shot in Bristol, southwest of Hartford. The circumstances of the shooting haven't been released yet. The officers were shot during an especially violent week for police in the U.S., which included a Mississippi officer getting killed on Tuesday night and three officers in Philadelphia and two in Decatur, Illinois, getting wounded early yesterday. Moving to Australia now, where flood warnings were issued and thousands of homes lost power as heavy rain lashed the southeast part of the country. Rivers across Australia's most populous states, New South Wales and Victoria, and the island state of Tasmania were rising dangerously. This with catchments soaked by months of above-average rainfall. Hundreds of people in the New South Wales city of Forbes, west of Sydney, were ordered to evacuate their homes ahead of a major flooding. Police found the body of a 46-year-old man Wednesday in his submerged car. This was in floodwaters near the city of Bathurst, which is west of Sydney. Well, it appears a goose on the loose caused a brief delay during baseball's National League playoff game last night. It was between the San Diego Padres and the Los Angeles Dodgers. The bird flew into Dodger Stadium and landed in right field with two outs in the eighth inning. It sat on the grass as Gavin Lux of the Dodgers singled to right. Then the pursuit was on. The grounds crew closed in on the goose, but the bird took off. It eventually landed near third base, and the crew was able to put it into a garbage bin. All right, take care, Canada. We'll see you next time on Forum Daily News.